Gene. Hey, uh, thank you, Steve, and uh, thank you, Adrian and Mitchell, for that. Yeah, I've been uh, studying high performers for the last 15, now 16 years. This is a journey that started for me when I was the uh, CTO and founder of a company called Tripwire in the uh, enterprise security space. And there were many, so, uh, and our goal was to study these high performers. These were the exemplar organizations that had the best project due date performance in development. They had the best operational stability, availability, and reliability in operations. And also the best posture of security and compliance. And our goal was to always understand how did these amazing organizations make their good to great transformation? Why? So that the rest of us could replicate those amazing outcomes. And so there were many surprises on that journey. But the biggest surprise to me was that it took me straight into the heart of the DevOps movement, which is, I think, not only intellectually interesting, but I think it is urgent and important because it solves the most important business problem of our generation. The last time we've had a transformation this large was when manufacturing was transformed during the 1980s. And so I have uh, three things I'd like to share with you today. One is a little bit of the why of DevOps in terms of why do I think DevOps is so universal in terms of the problem this uh, solves. Um, that's the why, but more importantly a bit of the, the how. What are the principles and patterns that um, Adrian has talked to uh, and Mitchell before that. And then more importantly, how are large complex organizations adopting DevOps? It's not just the unicorns like Netflix, Amazon, Spotify, Facebook. Increasingly it's organizations like Walmart, Nordstrom, Macy's, US Department of Homeland Security. So um, one of the things that we try to do in the uh, uh, as Adrian called it, the Phoenix Project horror story, was really capture this downward spiral that we saw happening in every technology organization. Whether we were a dev, test, operations, whether we were a DBA, where we were a, uh, a network engineer, left unchecked without something like DevOps would lead to horrendous outcomes. Not just for uh, product management, dev, test, operations, but also information security and ultimately the organization that we served. And the uh, root cause, or one of the major contributing factors for this downward spiral is I think what Ward Cunningham phrased most poetically back almost 11 years ago. He called it technical debt. And so although he meant it very much in the context of code, uh, and this applies just as much to the environment as well. And so he said technical debt is that which we feel the next time we want to make a change. Right, and so when I visualize technical debt, I view it like this. It is the accumulation of all the crap in the data center that we have allowed to go in um, and each time made with a promise that we're going to decommission it when we have more time. But the way that life works, and I think the way human nature works, is that there's never enough time, right? Uh, you know, life happens. And so technical debt is accrued every time we take shortcuts during a development project. It happens every time that we uh, don't focus on the non-functional requirements or the operations requirements early in the project. It happens every time developers don't write automated tests. It happens every time that we manually configure an environment. And technical debt you know, gets worse, just like financial debt. So technical debt, this is bad, but not as bad as this, right? Um, so some of you may have friends who've uh, been in you know, scenarios that look like this, and this is very bad for operations, but it's not so great for development as well. Because there are two downward spirals at work here. One is that at the, every, at the end of every software project, right, um, you know, we have one more fragile piece of our infrastructure that we have to then support, right? So IT is free like a, uh, like a puppy, right? IT is free like a puppy is free. Um, but there's actually a more insidious downward spiral that happens that's even more toxic, which is that deployments start taking longer. So think of a friend who's been associated with an application that took five minutes to deploy, so it's taking an hour, so it's taking a day, so it's taking a weekend, so it's taking a week. I've had first-hand experience of a $6 billion a year revenue application that took six weeks to deploy. It took 1,300 manual, uh, discrete, error-prone steps, right, that spanned from dev, test, operations, um, and it would tie up something like three to 400 people, right, for six weeks, and we would do it, you know, two to three times a year. Uh, and so when this happens, right, this sets conditions for the intertribal warfare that can exist between dev, test, and operations. So here's our friendly developer who checks code into the repo at 5 p.m. on Friday, right, and they will high five each other in the parking lot because they made the date, not realizing that they've set the entire data center on fire uh, for the entire weekend, and it's us ops people who have to fix it. And so at this point, no one's achieving their goals. 
deployments are taking ever longer to get to market. Um, yeah, deployments are taking longer to finish. The features are never making it to the customer. We have an ever increasing number of Sev1 outages in production. And operations, everybody downstream of development becomes increasingly buried in technical debt, right? Increasingly unable to pay down the technical debt when everybody knows that's how we can actually help the organization win in the marketplace. Uh, does anyone here have a friend that can resonate with some elements of this story? Maybe some of you, right? So, so you're not alone. I think that's what uh, leads to a sense of hopelessness and despair, right? That uh, we're stuck in a never-ending horror movie that keeps on repeating where we are powerless to change the outcomes. And we all feel like we're, the problem is actually getting worse over time. And so, of course, we are, we're all here because we know that there's a better way, right? How do we know this? Because these exemplar organizations, of which Netflix is absolutely one of them, Netflix, Amazon, Spotify, Facebook, they've all shown us that it's possible to do hundreds or even thousands of deployments per day while preserving world-class reliability, stability, and security, right? Something that we didn't even think possible uh, years before, right? And increasingly, it's not just these unicorns, it's the horses as well. Large, complex organizations that have been around for decades or even over a century, right? Like Macy's, like Raytheon, like uh, the uh, well, U.S. Department of Security is only been around for eight years. But um, it's, DevOps is not just for the unicorns, it's for the horses as well. So the seminal presentation that really, I think, is, was a starting gun for the DevOps movement was this famous presentation that was given by John Allspaugh and Paul Hammond at the Velocity Conference. So this famous presentation that was given in 2009 was this uh, presentation where they said, we are doing 10 deploys a day every day as a part of our daily work, right? Um, and so the Velocity Conference is where the unicorns hang out, of course. Um, but by all first-hand accounts, the people who were in that presentation just by hearing this presentation knew that they were in the presence of something historically significant. Uh, I must admit with some embarrassment that that was not my reaction. My reaction was more like this, right? It was, uh, you know, 10 deploys a day, that's, that's impossible. Even if it were possible, you know, it's probably reckless, irresponsible, uh, ill-advised, and probably immoral, right? Because what good person would want to do 10 deploys a day to someone else, you know, when they didn't deserve it? And yet I now believe, just like many of you, is that if we cannot create around us a system of work where we can enable everyone to do deploys on demand, then we risk irrelevance. It's not just dev, test, operations, DBAs, network engineering. You know, it's ultimately the organizations that we serve. One of the favorite, uh, my favorite presentations that comes out of the DevOps community was given by Theo Schlossnagel. He said, DevOps is a crappy term. It's incomplete, it's prone to misinterpretation. Right, what would Theo Schlossnagel call it? He would call it star ops, or maybe more pedantically, dot star ops, or maybe even more pedantically, it's every department ops. Because what he was asking was, where's, where's network engineering? Where's test? Where's uh, product management? Where's information security? Because that's essentially the entire coalition we need to mobilize in order to get these amazing outcomes of fast flow through the entire value stream without causing chaos and disruption downstream. So back in 2009, we all believed that 10 deploys a day was shockingly fast. It was almost unheard of. Um, and these days it's considered you know, mediocre, maybe average. Uh, one of the great uh, proof points of this came from John Jenkins. This is actually the, from the 2011 uh, Velocity Conference. He said they're not doing 10 deploys a day, they're doing one deploy every 11.6 seconds. So that's about a mean number of deployments of about uh, 23,000 per day. So that could be a code release into the production environment that's being you know, inv held invisible to the customer. It could be a functionality going live through the uh, conf a configuration change or something like a, a console. It could, be, uh, it could be an environment change. It could be thousands of new environments coming online, all considered to be one deploy. And incidentally, you know, even Amazon, you know, this is considered slow. Uh, earlier this year, Ken Exner, uh, director of Dev Resources at Amazon, said they're not doing you know, 23,000 deployments per day, they're doing 50 million deployments per year. That's actually, um, that's 136,000 deployments per day, right? So uh, one of the lessons I learned when I was working with the Software Engineering Institute at Carnegie Mellon University is that the best, is always, the best are always getting better, right? St Dr. Steven Spear from MIT said, when we study high performers, we always are dazzled by their altitude. But more importantly, we shouldn't concentrate on their altitude, we should concentrate on their rate of climb, right? Uh, am I making sense? So the best are always getting better. 
So by the way, why is this so important? Uh, uh, this quote for me was uh, a big aha moment. This came from Scott Cook. He's the founder of Intuit. He said for their TurboTax property, they did 165 production changes, or what they called experiments, at, during the peak three months of the tax filing season. And so I don't know about you, but when I, when I see a quote like this, my reaction is, these guys are idiots, right? You know, what sort of moron would make production changes when it matters the most? The way I was trained uh, in retailing is, we're so afraid of the holiday outage, we have a change freeze from October 1 to January 30th, right? That's what smart people do. Why would these morons make 165 production changes during peak seasons? And the answer seems uh, evident in the next paragraph, where he said, the business result of these production experiments were that we were able to increase the conversion of our website by 50%. Right, so here are my three aha moments. One is, uh, one, it takes great dev and ops collaboration to make this happen, right? In high tempo, high stress operations, right? It takes great skill and collaboration. Two, is maybe the best times to do production experiments is during peak seasons. In other words, what would have happened if that the TurboTax folks had waited until April 16th when the US tax filing season is over, right? They could have lost their prospects and maybe even their customers to the competition never again to return. And then third is what we already heard from Adrian, uh, is that the studies have shown one out of three or maybe one out of 10 ideas are actually exothermic, right? The only way we can tell a good idea from a bad idea is testing it with real life customers. Right? And just to show you how this transcends technology work, uh, Leonard Cohen, the famous singer-songwriter, he said, if I knew where the best songs came from, I would go there more often, right? So, you know, the only way that we can tell a good song from a bad song is testing it with real life customers. And I think that explains why so many organizations are adopting DevOps. It's not just the unicorns, it's the service providers, which includes Cisco. Yeah, it's financial services, it's retailing, it's manufacturing, it's government agencies, it's higher education. And the question then becomes, why are so many organizations, even these very traditional um, organizations adopting DevOps, and then after benchmarking over 14,000 organizations with Jez Humble, um, a friend of Adrian Cockcroft and mine, we now know with some certainty that it's because the business value of adopting DevOps is even higher than we thought. So over the last three years, Jez Humble and I have worked with uh, Puppet Labs to benchmark organizations. And we found that high performers are massively outperforming their non-high performing peers. They are more agile. They're doing 30 times more frequent deployments. That's deployments of code and deployments of changes in the environment. And more importantly, they can complete them 8,000 times faster. In other words, how quickly can they go from code committed, you know, whether it's by dev, tester operations, or even information security, through the test cycle, through their deployment cycle, to successfully running in production. High performers can do that in minutes, whereas lower, as lower performers will take months or even quarters. So month, minutes versus months. Not only are they doing more work, they're getting far better outcomes. When they do a deployment, whether it's in the code or the environment, they're twice as likely to succeed. And when something bad happens, whether it's a service impairment, service outage, security breach, compliance failure, they can fix it 12 times faster. In other words, the mean time to store service is 12 times faster. So, an amazing finding. You can be more agile and be more reliable at the same time. But even more amazingly, we found that the high performers, not only did they have better IT performance, they had better organizational performance. For those organizations, we found that high performers were twice as likely to exceed profitability, market share, and productivity goals. And for those nearly 500 organizations that gave us a stock ticker symbol, they had 50% higher market cap growth over three years. Which, by the way, is an absurd finding, right? I mean, how could the work environment or how an a sysadmin, a server admin, a network admin, or a developer, how could something that small impact the bottom line or be visible in stock price? And yet, if we believe that increasingly how all our organizations acquire customers and actually deliver value to them is through the technology value stream, then maybe, you know, being orders of magnitude better actually results in winners and losers, so, uh, which I find very exciting. So one of my favorite books, as Adrian uh, alluded to, is The Goal. Um, and how many people here have read it? So, uh, so this, is, uh, this is a book that was written in the 1980s. It is a novel about a plant manager who has to fix his cost and due date issues in 90 days, otherwise they shut the plant down. And it's just this amazing book that's integrated into almost every mainstream MBA curriculum. And 
you know, I read this book about 15, 18 years ago, and you know, after I read it, it's always been our aspiration to essentially rewrite the goal, but for the IT context, for the work that we do. And that's what the Phoenix Project is. So the, there are many similarities uh, by design, but one of them is they both have a Yoda, Mr. Miyagi character, who speaks in very difficult to understand ways. And so our Yoda speaks in the language of the three ways. So what I want to do is kind of walk you with those, what those three ways are, which are the principles from which you can derive all of the observed DevOps patterns and behaviors from. So the first way is about flow. How can you go, make work go as quickly as possible from left to right, from dev to ops? And by the way, why dev and ops? Because dev and ops are what's in between the organization that we serve and our customers. And so even though in the DevOps community, our favorite metric is probably deploys per day, right? We know that whether it's 10 deploys a day at Flickr or 23,000 deploys a day at Amazon, or I'm sorry, 136,000 deploys a day at Amazon. In manufacturing, you know, their most cherished metric is not this. Their most cherished metric is lead time. And so they would measure lead time as how quickly can we go from raw materials from one end of the plant to finished goods at the other. And there's this deeply held belief that lead time is the most accurate predictor of customer satisfaction, uh, quality, and even employee happiness. And we found that absolutely to be the case in the DevOps value stream as well. And so we would typically measure for our benchmarking, right, lead time to be deployment lead time. How quickly can we go from code committed through the test process, through deployment, to successfully running in production? And so I think in most typical organizations, as, a, uh, as uh, Damon Edwards is going to uh, talk more about after me, is that the typical lead time is measured in months, right? maybe even nine months. So whenever we want to do a deployment, we open up a ticket on the left, and by the time we're done at the right, it takes about nine months. Why does it take that long? It's because we had never have environments when we need it. They're never configured correctly. right? It takes two weeks to create the test data sets, four weeks to execute the manual regression testing, another four weeks to get the change approvals, another six weeks to get the security review, another four weeks to get the VLANs created, you know, et cetera, right? So that's, you know, I think, typical of um, enterprise operations. But when you have long lead times like this, it's also highly correlated with this. It, intense distrust between the functional silos. It's not just between dev and ops, it's, between, it's even between ops and ops, right? Storage guys don't like the network admins. Network admins don't like, uh, well, no one likes security, right? And there's this constant sense of betrayal between these functions. Also correlated with long lead times is this, horrendous catastrophic deployment failures, right? So, you know, if we think about the largest deployment errors in the last 20 years, what that, in my mind, is Toys R Us 1999, Amazon 2001, LinkedIn 2009, healthcare.gov, I don't care what your politics are, right? In general, when we have catastrophic deployment failures, in general, that's correlated, it's very highly correlated with lengthy lead times. One of the major contributing factors for this is that the first time that we got to see how the code actually runs in anything even resembling production, is during the deployment, right? So we spend a year and a half writing the code, right? But the only time we actually see how it behaves in production is during the deploy. And so the ca if you believe that, then one of the major countermeasures that we see in every high performer is this. As uh, Adrian mentioned, you know, operations creates everything as a service, right? You can get environments on demand. You don't have to open up a ticket. You don't have to wait four weeks. You can get it at the click of a button, right? And it will be spun up either internally or externally. And one of the best beneficiaries of this capability is development. In other words, if development can use production-like environments in the earliest stages of the development project, you know, this radically changes outcomes. So. Even now, uh, you know, years after this case study, this remains one of my favorite examples of how great great can be. So Facebook chat, when it was released to customers in 2008, um, was, would you believe, the largest technical undertaking that Facebook had undertaken. It was the largest project team. It was the first use of Erlang on the back end. It took one year for them to actually go from initiation to release to customers. What's interesting is how they used that year. So every day during the course of that project, the chat team would, in, would check in code into the source code repo. Whatever was in trunk would migrate into the production environment at least once per day. And moreover, without causing chaos and disruption downstream, 
and they used every Facebook browser user session as a test harness. In other words, they were sending invisible chat messages to the backend infrastructure unbeknownst to the customer so they could do load testing. And so the result of this was that they were able to, upon the release of the functionality, go from zero users to 70 million users overnight without a hitch. How? They were testing in production for nearly a year. And by the way, as an ops person, um, I can say, you know, just to show you where I come from, if you had told me five years ago that testing in production was a good thing, I would say that's crap. That's what lazy developers do to ops people because they hate us, right? It's because they're lazy, they don't know how to plan, right? You know, um, and yet I now believe that it is an absolute game changer, right? Because if we can t integrate testing into the daily work of development, it changes outcomes. No more do we have to do deployments on Friday at midnight and work all weekend right, to get things running. We can do deployments in the middle of the day and now work, dev and ops are working the same hours as it should be. And just to share with you why I think this is so important, this quote comes from Nathan Schimmick. He said, as a lifelong ops practitioner, I know that we need DevOps to make our work humane. In my past, I've worked on every holiday, on my birthday, even worse, on my spouse's birthday, and even on the day my son was born. And so some of you may have friends right, who have been in situations without a sense of like duty or obligation or because they didn't even have a choice, you know, did something similar. And the reason why I think we share this interest in DevOps is that we know it doesn't have to be this way. So um, let me just share with you uh, how these transitions typically happen. One of my favorite quotes in the goal is this one phrase, in any flow of work, whether it's manufacturing or the work that we do, you know, there's always a direction of work, a direction of f flow, and there's always one and only one bottleneck. And any improvement not made of that bottleneck is an illusion, right? And here was his proof point. If you improve something after the bottleneck, it will always remain starved for work because it's always waiting for work from the bottleneck. If you improve something before the bottleneck, the work will just pile up at the bottleneck even faster, right? Am I making sense? And so, you know, the caution is you always have to focus improvement at the bottleneck. And so in the work that we do, here's how the typical bottleneck moves as we go from lead times measured in months to lead time measured in minutes. In general, it starts off at environment creation, right? Uh, we can't get to 10 deploys a day if every time we want to do a deployment, we have to wait four weeks to get a test environment, right? So the countermeasure is get that on demand, right? Whether it's a VM, a container, a uh, platform as a service, whatever. After that, the constraint typically moves to the code deployment process. We can't get to 10 deploys a day if every time we do a deploy, we have to execute 1,300 manual steps and we have to wait six weeks you know, for the networking guys to make the changes, right? So the countermeasure is how do we automate that as much as possible, right? So that we can ideally you know, do it in seconds or at least as fast as we want to do deploys. After that, the uh, constraint typically moves to test, setup, and run. Right, we can't get to 10 deploys a day if every time we want to do a deployment, it takes two weeks to create the test environments and the test data sets, and then four weeks to execute the manual regression testing. So the countermeasure is not only do we have to automate all those tests, right, or automate whatever tests are needed, but in general we have to massively parallelize them so that the test rate can keep up with the deployment rate. And after that, the constraint usually becomes architecture. In other words, we can't get to 10 deploys a day if every time we want to do a deployment, uh, we have to get approval from 35 other different product groups, and we have to wait for 1,500 other developers to catch up with us. Right? And when that ha why, would they, why would we need these approvals? It's because everyone's so afraid that our small little change is going to cause some sort of global catastrophic failure. Right? And that is a great... Um, uh, that's an indication of that things are too tightly coupled, right, as Adrian mentioned. So the countermeasure is how do we make them less loosely, less tightly coupled, move to something that looks more like a service-oriented architecture, so that small teams can do deployments on demand, right, independently. And then after that, then the constraint becomes development and product owners. One of the things that I loved hearing Adrian say that uh, just was a huge aha moment was, that's where we want the constraint to be. In other words, how many good business ideas can we come up with that are worth testing with real life customers? Right? So whether we are in dev, test, operations, or information security, whether we're a DBA or a network admin, the goal is to increase developer productivity. Right? We should not be the constraint. And so, by the way, just to viscerally you know, paint, what does it feel like to be a constraint? I, feel, I think it feels like this. Every time when the organization says, here's where we are and here's where we need to be, 
like who's in the way, right? It's either the DBA or the network admin, right? And so that's a very uncomfortable place to be. And just to share with you why I think the deploys per day measure is so interesting uh, is I think it's actually hiding an even more important metric. To make this case, uh, I want to point to Etsy. This is where John Allspaw's at these days. If, let's look at what, how, what is their deploys per day over time. They went from doing 30 to 50 to doing hundreds of deploys per day. Incidentally, they just went public a couple weeks ago. The question then becomes, what changed at Etsy that could explain this ever-increasing number of deployments? And the answer is nothing changed at Etsy during that time period. The only thing that changed at Etsy was the number of developers. In other words, so I, this is why I believe that deploys per day is actually hiding another even more important metric, which is deploys per day per developer. In other words, so many of us were trained by Fred Brooks and the Mythical Man Month, right? If you, um, if you double the number of developers, you double the testing effort, the integration effort, and the deployment effort, right? And so that is what the fact of life. And yet, I think what DevOps is showing us is that under certain conditions, we can actually scale developer productivity linearly with the number of developers. Am I making, am I making too audacious of a claim? So and I think that's uh, what this work is all about. And so this is how we get to this 50 million deploys a year, right? Thousands of teams working with a high degree of autonomy, right, in multiple environments decoupled from each other. So the outcome of the first way is we have a single repo for code and environment. Would you believe the top predictor of performance, not just IT performance, but organizational performance, was whether ops was using version control. In fact, ops using version control was a higher predictor of performance than dev using version control, right? Why? Because where do you have more entropy and more configurable settings? It's not in the code, it's in the environment, right? So when you have everything in version control, this is what enables determinism in the release process. We have consistent environments, dev, test, and production all synchronized always, long before the big deployment. And we have developers checking code in daily with freedom and autonomy and safety, well, and through testing, of course. And what it essentially allows us to do is free ourselves from this learned behavior that deployments hurt. Right? We don't have to do them at midnight and work all weekend. Instead, we can do them in the middle of the day like normal people. Right? And if we can shrink the deployment cycle times to minutes, well, suddenly we can do multiple deploys a day like the unicorns. So that's the first way from, as we go from left to right. The second way is about the reciprocal flow of feedback. In other words, whenever something goes wrong, how do we feed that learning to the earliest stages of the software development life cycle so that we can ideally prevent that bad thing from happening again. And if we can't prevent it, at least enable quicker detection and recovery. And so the paragon of that principle is without, without a doubt the Toyota and Cord. And so I spent a week at the University of Michigan getting trained in the Toyota Kata and Toyota, Toyota production process. And it, much to my astonishment, right, on the plant floor, you could actually see the Toyota and Cord. In other words, on top of every work center, Right, is this thing called the and on cord. And everybody is trained, whether you're a regional vice president, a plant manager, uh, a work center supervisor, or wherever you're on the floor, right? If something goes wrong, pull the cord. Right? So if the parts are defective, pull the cord. If the parts aren't there, we pull the cord. Even if the assembly took longer than documented, we pull the cord. If it took a minute 20 seconds versus a minute 55, uh, if it took a minute 20 versus 55 seconds, we pull the cord. So among my learned colleagues here, can anyone speculate how many times in a typical Toyota plant is the and on cord pulled in a given day? How many and on cord pulls per day? Order of magnitude? Zero, higher? <laughs> Zero, good guess. The, the real answer is 3,500 times a day. Right? And so of course you can imagine when I uh, first read that, my first reaction was, these guys are morons, right? Why would they pull the cord 3,500 times a day? In other words, don't they know that every time we pull the cord, we're actually magnifying a local disturbance and causing a global disturbance, right? You know, why would we do that? And the answer is astonishing. This, everybody would say it's because that we need, it's the only way that we can sustain a build tempo of 2,000 vehicles per day. That's one every 55 seconds. So um, essentially what they're verbalizing 
is that if we don't swarm the problem and stop work, right, we are going to allow technical debt to accrue downstream, where it's going to be far more expensive to fix, if not maybe even impossible. But there's actually even a more visceral uh, reason to give, which is that if we don't s solve the problem here, we're going to have the same problem 55 seconds later. Right? So more improvement than daily work is the improvement of daily work. So the analog of Toyota in the work that we do, I think, is, go is Google. Back in 2013, they had 15,000 uh, engineers, so that's dev and operations and information security, working on 4,000 simultaneous projects. And trust me, there is no spreadsheet at Google with 4,000 rows that's being managed by a project management office. Right? There's a tremendous degree of autonomy right, in order and productivity here. All source code is checked into one single repo. Uh, one version of each library allowed. Uh, they're doing, they were doing at the time 5,500 code commits per day with 75 million test cases run daily, right? And so the, you know, uh, you may roll your eyes and say, well, that's easy if you have, you know, two million, five million servers, right? Um, but that's not the real point. The real point is why would they bother running test, 75 million test cases, let alone writing them? And the answer is revealed in the next phrase, which I think is almost poetic. He said, the reason we do this is that it's only through automated testing that we can transform fear into boredom. Right, he said, imagine the paralyzing fear any new engineer has at Google, knowing that any time they commit code, right, any time they hit enter, right, they could take down every Google property all at the same time, right, which has happened. Right, and so the only way that you can get people productive is to show them that there's a safety net of automated testing that's making the work safe. Uh, um, Mr. Cockcroft mentioned the, uh, one of my favorite quotes from Patrick Lightbody. He said this when he was the CEO of Browser Mob. He's now the VP of uh, Product Management at New Relic. He said, we found that when we woke up developers at 2 a.m., defects got fixed faster than ever. Right? And it's not because he hated developers. Right? It's, uh, you know, I think what he was putting his finger on is that if we want shared goals between dev, test, and operations, we need some element of shared pain. And Werner Vogels at Amazon would say it even more succinctly. If you help build it, you must help run it. And I'm aware that jackasses like me putting up slides like this uh, is actually creating a backlash among the development community. Right? In other words, developers are now saying, we did not become developers to wear a pager. Right? That's for the ops people, right? you know, who uh, you know, they work so hard to get the CCIE. Right? That's why, you know, why? Because they like wearing pagers. Right? That's not our job. And yet, I think a more compelling narrative is this. Tim Tischler, who was leading the DevOps initiative at Nike, he said, as a career-long developer, there's never been a more satisfying point in my career than when I got to write the code, deploy it into production myself, see the happy customers when it worked, and see their angry shaking fists when it didn't, right? and when I could fix it myself. In other words, I didn't have to open up a ticket. I didn't have to wait a day for someone to fix it when I could have fixed it faster myself. But more importantly, I would have learned something, right? So I could prevent it from happening again in the future. And so I think you know, our inability to write code, run it in production, and fix it ourselves, that our decreased ability to do that over the last 10 years have taken some of the joy out of the technology work that we do. And I think DevOps is, goes a great way into bringing it back. Uh, let me go to uh, another important second way attribute, which is culture. Uh, in the Puppet Labs DevOps survey of practice that we did with Jez Humble, we found that the third highest predictor of performance was organizational culture. This is the Westrom organizational typology model. What Dr. Westrom found was that in healthcare organizations, the highest predictor of patient safety was uh, culture, right? So we found that this also applies in the work that we do. Among the lowest performers was highly correlated with what they call pathological cultures, where we shoot messengers who tell bad news. We shirk responsibilities. We discourage bridging between teams. In uh, healthcare, it was like whether it was ER, pharmacy, nursing, outpatient care, right? In the work that we do, it's you know, between dev, test operations, storage, networking, and so forth. We cover up failures. Why? Because messengers of bad news are shot. And this leads to a culture of fear, right? That we're afraid to make changes because of punitive, you know, uh, the punishment. In the middle, we have bureaucratic, just cultures. But 
what we found in high performers, they were almost all universally correlated with high trust cultures. We train messengers to tell bad news. We teach them to lead blameless post-mortems, or as uh, Adrian would call it, post-incident uh, reviews. Be why do developers attend them? Because uptime and availability is not just operations job, it's everyone's job, just like information security is everybody's job. This means that we have to bridge between functions, and when failures happen, it causes a genuine sense of inquiry. And uh, you know, just to share with you my biggest surprise, I, mean, I had mentioned in the panel session, I think where I found the most amount of um, dissonance with the way I was trained, especially as an auditor, was around the change control function. You know, the story I told was about John Alspaugh, who heads up tech ops at Etsy. He was telling a story about when a new engineer asked him, John, is it okay for me to make this change? Right? To which John Alspaugh responded, I don't know. Is it? <laughs> right? In other words, he refused to own any of the responsibility for the quality of the change. That was put solely on, you know, back on the shoulders of the implementer. The question that John Alspaugh would ask is, did you get someone to review your change? Do you know who the absolute subject matter expert is for change of this category? Did you do everything that you could to ensure that when this goes into production, it will operate as designed? And if you did, make the change, right? And I think that is what high trust looks like. So uh, this means that we don't rely on some sort of approval for changes from some external body. Uh, instead, we rely on peer review, right? From someone who actually knows you know, what's going on. Uh, we have discipline testing that allows small teams to work with autonomy and safety. Uh, we have proactive monitoring of the test environment, of, of the production environment. And all these things allow us to fix uh, issues faster than ever. Combined with the high trust culture, allows groups to communicate and coordinate better and everyone gets more work done. So I want to share with you one uh, last pattern for the th third way, which is all about how do we allow this high trust culture that allows for organizational learning. Incidentally, organizational learning is one of the highest predictors of performance in the, in the literature. And I think the exemplar of this is actually Adrian Cockcroft. You know, he, one of my favorite quotes from him that I heard from him five years ago was, our goal at Netflix is to do painful things more frequently. So even though that we make life hell for developers at times, the response that we get from development is thank you. Thank you so much because we know that will make future rollouts go even more smoothly. And I think the best evidence of the effectiveness of this philosophy and practice was the first Amazon EC2 outage that happened in 2011. And so many of us will remember this because everybody who was on AWS EC2 went down with one very curious example, Netflix. And so everybody was asking, what is Netflix doing differently that led to such a different outcome? The leading theory, of course, was that you know, Netflix is Amazon's largest customer. You know, they were given some sort of secret flag that, you know, called do not crash, right? Yeah, this is obvious, right? But the real answer was revealed in the seminal blog post where essentially they revealed two very surprising things. One was uh, this design decision that they had made that in order to survive failures, we have, must have no single point of failures of which EC2 is one. In other words, Amazon will never be there when we need them most. And secondly, in order to survive failure, we're going to have to fail all the time. And that's when they unveiled the now famous Chaos Monkey, right? This audacious piece of code that randomly kills processes and entire compute instances in production. Right, and so I will joke that you know, there's two things that Adrian rarely tells, but he should actually tell more often. One is before you run Chaos Monkey in production, run it first in test, right? You know, because they did. Two is, did you know on that day, April 21st, 2011, Netflix went six hours into that EC2 outage before declaring a 7-1 incident. In other words, every hour they would convene and say, should we declare a 7-1 incident? And their conclusion was always, was always no. You know, it will probably come back, it usually does. Only six hours into the outage did they say, maybe we should activate some business continuity procedures just in case if it doesn't, right? So, would you believe that this actually happened again in 2014, in the great Amazon reboot of 2014, when they had to apply the security Zen patch to 10% of the entire EC2 fleet? Christos Kalantzis said, when we found out the news, our jaws dropped, especially around the production Cassandra database nodes, right? We felt physically ill. But then he goes on to say, 
But then I remembered that we've been running Chaos Monkey for years. Bring it on. So what was the outcome? Out of the 2,700 production database nodes, 218 were rebooted, 22 didn't even come back up again. In other words, they bricked their database nodes, right? Um, and yet no customer downtime was, was created. In fact, I just learned from Roy Rappaport some months ago is that they weren't even in the office, right? They were down in Hollywood, right, celebrating the acquisition of their one millionth customer, right? So not only were they not on a seven outage call, they were at a party. And I think that is what the reward is by doing these things extremely well. If we care about availability, we should fearlessly test availability you know, in production. And we can only do that by paying technical debt down as we go. 20% of all dev and ops cycles should be used how are dev and ops fit to fix problematic areas of the code, to do our re-architectures, to do our refactorings, to allow these sort of patterns to be put into place. So it's not just the unicorns, you know, increasingly it's organizations that look like this. Macy's, Disney, Target, US Department of Homeland Security. By the way, at the DevOps Enterprise Conference, the most popular talk was given by Mark Schwartz, the CIO of the US Citizenship and Immigration Services inside the US Department of Homeland Security. So my, the reason why I say that is if they can do it inside of DHS, you can do it anywhere. So um, why do I think this is important? This downward spiral happens everywhere. It affects the unicorns and horses. In fact, they're really, it turns out unicorns and horses are the same species. I think a better metaphor would be you've got the thoroughbreds who are gonna win in the marketplace at the expense of those who are gonna be sent to the glue factory, right? The 40% of the Fortune 500 that are not gonna be around in 20 years. Uh, and you know, there's a huge amount of economic value there. So if you're interested in any of this, uh, just send an email to realgenekim at sendyourslides.com with the subject line of DevOps. You get a full version of this presentation, a free excerpt of the Phoenix Project book in PDF form, links to the DevOps Enterprise slides and videos, information on the upcoming DevOps Enterprise conference, um, and early drafts of DevOps code. And incidentally, if you want a free copy of the uh, Phoenix Project book, Go to the Puppet Labs booth at 415. I'll be there signing books and uh, they're giving away a bunch of books for free. So with that, thank you so much for your time. Hopefully I'll see you at 415. Gene, thank you very much. Great job. Gene, I think we have a, a, a couple of seconds left, a couple of minutes left for just uh, one or two quick questions. Do we have any from the audience? We do, run right here. Oh. Hey Gene, John Ryan Ansible. Uh, a quick question uh, just around the adoption of DevOps and networking. We're seeing a lot of uptick in uh, the networking, Cisco, uh, F5, across the board yeah. using Ansible, uh, but obviously a very different environment. They're coming from CLI-based versus IT automation. Just kind of your observations overall in the market and I, what I do you love, recommend? Yeah, I love that question. It's like, I think Adrian, I heard it first from Adrian again. I hear everything from Adrian. My job in life is just to listen to Adrian and uh, repeat what he says. Develop driven infrastructure, right? It's, it means software find everything. Um, and it, say what? Jerry Chen, right? Jerry Chen, right. Uh, I'll channel Adrian Cockcroft. Um, and if you can do it for databases and if you can do it for networking, I really think it means that almost every piece of infrastructure now really is uh, able, the need is how to create those things on demand to increase developer productivity. So even in networking, right? Uh, even in databases, you know, I think the trends are inexorable. Thank you. Thank you, Gene. Thank you very much. Uh, Gene will be available on the side here for just